Thank you for downloading this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Chip Ford, and I will be your host for today's episode titled Indian Canoes. Right now, you might be sitting in traffic listening to this podcast and wondering if there is a better way to get around Central Florida than traveling through bumper-to-bumper traffic on I-4 during rush hour. The items we examine in this episode were the primary means of travel for thousands of years in Central Florida. Today, when we think of traveling around Central Florida, images of vehicles transporting tourists, families running errands, or commuters on their way to work come to mind. Large semi-trucks delivering consumer goods, agricultural products, food, and natural resources to virtually every community in Central Florida are a common sight on Florida's many interstates and highways. Today's podcast features two examples from Central Florida. The first, a Tamaquan canoe dated from 1000 CE, and the second, a Seminole canoe dating back to 1752. Historians estimate that at the time of European contact, Florida's native population numbered somewhere around 350,000 people. Dr. Gerald Milanich, Emeritus Professor at the University of Florida, tells us the relationship between the St. John's culture and the Tamaquan Indians. Somewhere between about 1,000 and 500 B.C., uh, we have enough information on the pre-Columbian peoples all over Florida to divide them up into archaeological cultures. One is the St. John's culture that lasts oh, from you know, 1,000 B.C. on up into the colonial period, as I said. Yeah. There probably never were Indians known as Tamuqua Indians. That was a term that the French picked up from some Indians on the uh, St. John's River in the Duval County, what's now the Duval County area. It was a term that the Indians used to refer to their enemies. The Tamuqua actually were made up of probably many, many, many tens, perhaps a hundred uh, separate little societies. And some of those Tamuquan societies certainly were in the uh, general Orange, Seminole, Lake County area. And we find uh, St. John's culture uh, artifacts there. These shallow waterways and miles of Florida coastline also made the canoe an ideal transportation solution to those who called this area home. With it, they could transport cargo, as well as people, providing Florida's native peoples with access to the long-distance trade networks that stretch throughout eastern North America and the Caribbean. Dr. Mark Long, from the University of Central Florida, gives us a wider window to understand the breadth of these transportation networks. Natives used canoes to, to link, in the case of Florida, to link Florida to a much broader um, Caribbean sort of uh, uh, environment, uh, trade within the Bahamas and even Cuba. So there's a, a long-standing tradition of the canoe as a way of, of, of sort of making Florida's maritime presence be a useful highway rather than a barrier, right? Recent drought conditions cause the water levels of many central Florida lakes to recede. As a result, almost 400 canoes have been unearthed from 225 sites around Florida. One of the most significant instances occurred in Noonan's Lake, east of Gainesville. In 2000, a group of high school students found 101 dugout canoes, ranging from 500 to 5,000 years old. The discovery was the largest of its kind in North America. We talked to Donna Rule at the Florida Museum of Natural History about the significance of the prehistoric dugout canoe and these trade networks. I think there's far more significance to the prehistoric dugout canoe and what that really means to not only transportation but trade, travel, exchange, and the ability for Native Americans to move far more widely 
uh, far greater distances. We have evidence of hundreds of canoes now in Florida's prehistoric record. And that, to me, is suggestive that there's far more movement on the landscape, far more use of this as a means of transportation. But the other thing that it's showing us, and I think is an even more significant component to the dugout in and of itself, is that we have indirect evidence of canoe by not only the obvious things like paddles and poles, what they were using to manipulate the canoes in and around areas, but we have exotic goods showing up at sites that you wouldn't expect, or non-local goods, if you will, maybe that's a better term. We're finding chert in areas that chert wouldn't be. We're finding soapstone bowls that they couldn't carry a 40 or 50 or 60 pound material resource that comes from Georgia and find it on an island off the coast of Florida. Um, These are the kinds of things that are very significant in how the canoe was a major part and an integral part of prehistoric life. A similar discovery in central Florida, like that of Noonan's Lake, unearthed a Tamuquan canoe now on display at the Orange County Regional History Center in Orlando. It dates from 1000 CE. Donna Rule, who researched the Noonan's Lake canoes, tells us about how the design of these canoes changed little over thousands of years. Interestingly, for years, people thought that the dugout canoe went through this evolution where you had a more crude form, if you will, or a blunt-ended canoe where both the bow and the stern were similar in shape. Um, But after the result of the 2000 Uh, finding of the Noonan's Lake canoes, we had the opportunity to date 53 of the 101 and found that the earliest canoe, as well as one of the more recent ones, um, actually shows that that wasn't the case at all. There isn't quite this unilinear evolutionary pattern, and what we're seeing is very similar forms through time, both in how they were crafted as well as the shapes of these canoes with similar bows and sterns as well as how they may have created thwarts inside of them for sitting on or standing, etc. All of these various components to the canoe do not seem to have a drastic change in shape until well into the contact period. So for almost five to 7,000 years, we see a very similar form and a very similar manufacture, whether it's canoes from North Florida or North Central Florida or even South Florida from the few that we have. Following European contact, and later colonization, Florida's original inhabitants were decimated by disease, enslavement, and warfare. By the mid-17th century, only a few hundred Tamuquans remained. As these native peoples disappeared, the Creeks and other Indians of Alabama and southern Georgia migrated into Florida. They established trade networks with the Spanish. The Creeks that eventually moved to Florida developed their own culture. They became known as Seminoles, a derivative of the Spanish word Cimarron, meaning runaway, or those living apart from the traditional lands. Eventually, they began settling in the central regions formerly occupied by the Tamuquans. We asked Donna Rule about the impact of European colonization on Indian canoes. I'm not sure that the European influence is what changed the canoe. I think the craftsmanship at some levels with the Seminole canoes coming in, there are similarities in earlier Seminole canoes, the ones that we know that date to the archaeological record, if you will, that's pre-contact as opposed to post-contact. I think it's the artisan and the change in the tools that they're using. Instead of using shell or lithic or stone resources, basically, depending on where they are in the state, if they're in the areas where we have these kinds of stone tools versus shell along the coast, etc., they're beginning to use metal. And I think the metal tools um, are allowing for a more angular shape. They're allowing for a little bit more of a development of the bow and more pronounced shoulders up towards the prow. And that is something that people have suggested has been something that's a signature of some of these artisan and craftsmen of the Seminole. Um, So I think that's a unique part of possibly because of the fact that they were more in the Everglades, they were moving through grasses, they might have needed a broader shouldered flat front that allowed them to penetrate through those grasses a little bit more easily than what the prehistoric rounded dugout needed to do.
One Seminole canoe, dated to 1752, is on display at the Osceola Welcome Center and History Museum in Kissimmee, Florida. The canoe was uncovered in 1972 by workmen along the banks of Reedy Creek near the Point Siena Overlook in Osceola County. Archaeologists believe the canoe was created in the mid-1700s, which is the same time the Seminoles arrived into Central Florida. As such, it is most likely it was constructed using steel tools. Dr. Long reminds us that while the birth of the canoe remains a product of the Americas, it was quickly adapted by Europeans. It, it's interesting. I mean, the canoe becomes uh, a central mode of transportation in the early sort of colonial period uh, in a way that's very quickly forgotten uh, by, by many historians, uh, except for those who deal specifically with things like the fur trade, because it's, you know, it is obviously the, the way in which that, uh, that trade took place. It's, it's interesting. I mean, um, we go back to Frederick Jackson Turner, right? He talks uh, often, or he talks in his essay about how the the colonist is stripped of his western dress and you know puts on the moccasins of the of the indian and makes his way into the woods and you know for him this is the genesis of the of american you know exceptionalism and american democratic governance uh, but it's also true of the canoe right the colonist does in fact adopt the, the the waterborne form of transportation from native americans whether it's a dugout further south or uh, further north where you have the right trees for this the birch bark canoe which is a much lighter uh, and better craft to paddle um, you find both natives and um, uh, European colonists using that form of transportation frequently. While you would be hard pressed to find chariots and stagecoaches in use today, modern canoes are not uncommon throughout America's scenic waterways. If you are still traveling along I-4 or some other road or highway, see how long it takes you to notice someone in an automobile transporting a canoe to one of Florida's many lakes or rivers and think about the prehistoric Indian engineers who pioneered this technology thousands of years ago. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about these canoes featured in this podcast, visit the Orange County Regional History Center at 65 East Central Boulevard, Orlando, Florida, 32801, and the Osceola County Welcome Center and History Museum at 4155 West Vine Street, Kissimmee, Florida, 34741. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled, Celts. Mm -hmm.